Okay, so with that, uh, I will hand the reins over to our keynote speaker, Professor Ann Motion.
concerns the proper timing of when to start practicing collaborative interdisciplinarity. Now, as an early career or pre-tenure professional, later, we heard two conflicting bits of advice. One is stay in your discipline, wait till you're tenured, versus become interdisciplinary, ASAP. It's exciting, it's cool, it's fun. Now, instead of taking sides, because I believe they are both right and they're both wrong, I'd rather explore this debate. In fact, I'd like to explore this question. Is this debate a dialectic? Now, a dialectic, as you know, is formed out of an ongoing relationship between two things that seem to be in tension with each other. Yet these two things also need each other in order to exist. They are mutually constituted. So on the one hand, we have those in favor of interdisciplinarity who believe that being in a single discipline or attacking a problem from a single perspective is not going to be as effective in solving problems as it would be if we adopted multiple perspectives or got many heads together. This side of the dialectic exists, therefore, in reaction to the downsides of disciplinarity. On the other hand, there's the disciplinarians who believe that interdisciplinarity mm -hmm. is not everything that it's cracked up to be. They've witnessed the <coughs> work, and here's their assessment. It's a fad. Its value is hard to measure, particularly at tenure time. There's a higher likelihood for failure. It presents administrative and institutional challenges, etc. To which the other side has a rebuttal. We're not fat. Some things we're studying, like climate change, they can't be tackled alone. Besides, we need you disciplines to train the people who are going to help us out. And the administration, they think that this makes sense because we can grab different researchers and put them to work on common problems and use that base to go after external funds in many places and do it fast. And the debate goes on and on. So my next question is, what's driving this dialectic into being? I've been discussing this for a long time with Peg Herman, the director of the Moynihan Institute of Global Affairs in the Maxwell School. Moynihan is an interdisciplinary unit with a number of ongoing projects, so we talk about these kinds of things quite a lot. What Peg has helped me see is that this debate over interdisciplinarity is nothing new. It comes and goes. When she was a graduate student in the 1960s, one particular form of interdisciplinarity, area or regional studies, had been around for about a decade in response to the Cold War. Urban studies was also just starting to emerge in response to the Civil Rights Movement. By 1980, however, both of these initiatives were starting to be questioned. Were they needed? Should universities be funding them? Gradually, many area, regional studies, and urban studies programs were closed. Today, the debate now involves the wisdom of, of dedicating scarce university resources to new interdisciplinarity initiatives that will tackle pre pressing problems like sea level rise, or living in a post-peak oil world, or digitalization. What that sequence, that historical sequence, is leading me to believe is that not only has the dialectic surrounding interdisciplinarity changed over time, but what drives that change is the creative destruction of the academy. Old things are being phased out in favor of the new. This list is not exhaustive, but here are some examples. From the 1950s to 1970s, a university education was considered a public good. Academic researchers were largely funded by the state. Students were encouraged to take a liberal arts and science curriculum. 
Academic units were organized around a 19th century Germanic disciplinal structure. Academic freedom and job security were protected by tenure. Around about 1980, that began to change, and changed fast. Tax revolts, starting in California, questioned public expenditures on something that was going to subsidize wealth creation in individuals. Shouldn't parents and students be paying for higher ed themselves, given the higher salaries that would eventually be earned with a university degree, they asked. Shouldn't parents and students be paying the state back in full? Additionally, under this new model, more research was conducted in support of the private sector, funded by the private sector. Universities then faced the challenges of incorporating new information technologies into campus infrastructures. Also, the humanities came under siege with the rise of STEM. Relevance became the word of the day. University administration taking cues from the business world, began implementing more flexible hiring practices and limiting the role of tenure. We could probably spend an hour alone talking about the ways in which these transitions have fed into changes that have taken place in the dialectic. One reason why I think the wait till your tenure stance on interdisciplinarity has come up is because of these shifts. In some fields and in some universities, discipline-based departments are pitted in stiff competition with interdisciplinary centers and institutes for resources. In fact, in some places, it is the overhead generated by the centers and institutes that subsidizes the continued existence of some departments. So the worry goes, does this signal the death of disciplines? My answer? Not necessarily. First, as someone who studies the geography of creative destruction, I've learned that this process occurs unevenly as it moves, like the economist Joseph Schumpeter said, with gale force across the landscape. Some institutions are going to be innovators and get rid of the old quite quickly. Others will wait around and see how things pan out and be laggards. Or they won't have access to the resources that it takes to move to a more inter interdisciplinary university model. They will never change and will become anachronisms. Second, the directors of most institutes, centers, and interdisciplinary degree programs will tell you that the quality of interdisciplinary work that can be accomplished rests to a large degree on the strength of the discipline-based departments from which their units draw. How can you have interdisciplinarity if the participants aren't coming from strong disciplinary backgrounds? A friend at Berkeley calls interdisciplinarity that doesn't have a strong disciplinal base the hollow bunny model. It looks great on the outside. But when it comes to really getting down and doing some work, where's the substance from which to draw? For many reasons, she likes the Mr. Solid better. Where many disciplines contribute a richness of language, methods, concepts, and knowledge that can be tapped into. Third, and as I mentioned at the outset, there are different kinds of interdisciplinarity which I think we are all sort of fostered to embody as we go through the educational system. Although what I'll talk about next relates mainly to the US. After teaching a course on the geography of education that includes some examination of other countries, I think this will ring true for those of you who have had the bulk of your education in another country. All of us started our academic lives in a multidisciplinary world. Reading, writing, arithmetic, then history, geography, social studies, chemistry, bio, algebra, calc, trade, literature, government, foreign languages, etc., etc., etc. With the notable exceptions of social studies and foreign languages in the U.S., much of that education was carried on in disciplinal silos. 
students scurry from course to course to get exposure, but how much of a connection are they helped to see between those courses? Lots of different kinds of content, not many connections made between that content. That's multidisciplinarity. When a student declares a major in college, or moves into a master's program, or is getting ready to sit prelims or comps, they move out of that multidisciplinary world and into one where they are really focused, immersion in their field. The question then becomes, after this, will they have the opportunity to re-emerge and become interdisciplinary once again, or at all? For most of us, the happy answer is yes. It can happen during dissertating, through formal and informal channels, just simply by getting to know other graduate students from other fields at gatherings like this today. Those sorts of encounters are invaluable because they force us to resurrect what we learned before college and during the first couple of years of our general college education and it helps us to put our disciplinal training back into broader context. And who knows, events like this might even lead to actual interdisciplinary collaboration. Finally, there is the end goal, transdisciplinarity. This is actually a term that was coined and popularized by the developmental psychologist Jean Piaget. He believed that transdisciplinarity occurs when researchers and teachers from different disciplines assemble their collaborative work around specific problems or themes and end up learning so much about the others around the table that they can easily identify and delegate subtasks that would be part of a larger working whole. Getting to this place, however, is difficult. I've been involved in more than a couple of projects that fell apart right when we were on the precipice, and Trish Lowney knows about these. I think they failed because the participants began feeling a tug of war between their disciplinal identities and this new thing toward which we were moving. It was all consuming. Still, I wouldn't trade those experiences for anything. They have been the happiest moments of my intellectual growth since grad school. So before I close this morning, I'd like to return to embodied and collaborative interdisciplinarity for a moment. It is the realm into which most of you are being called right now in your professional lives, should you answer the call. Frankly, I'm not sure to what extent you have a choice in the matter. To review, interdisciplinarity becomes embodied when an emerging scholar begins to graph theories, methods, concepts, and knowledge from other disciplines onto the theories, methods, concepts, and knowledge they are learning in their home discipline. Here, I've given a couple of examples of what that might look like. You can probably think of your own examples from your own fields. And if you can't, then that is really interesting and perhaps reveal something about the ways in which interdisciplinarity has moved unevenly through Syracuse University. Collaborative disciplinary, interdisciplinarity. That's when researchers or teachers from different fields come together to form a team. Their purpose, to tackle some problem that they would have trouble tackling on their own. Again, this is the form of interdisciplinarity over which the presenters in the two video clips at the outset were voicing the oppositional sides of that dialectic. So here are some ideas to ponder, some conclusions that aren't really conclusions, but hopefully starting points for discussion. First, the way I see it, Interdisciplinarity isn't really a yes, I'll do it, or no, I'll avoid it decision. All advanced scholars have grappled with it to some degree during their training and professional lives. It is that tug of war between breadth and narrowness, right? Second, there really is no one-size-fits-all model for interdisciplinarity. So saying it's something to avoid or something to embrace is rather mm, reductionist and dangerous. 
everything depends on context. Some of you will find it easy to pursue the collaborative version because you'll be going to work outside the academy in a research think tank where knowledge is produced through teamwork. Some of you will be at universities where it is rewarded too. The trick is to operate as a good ethnographer and learn the culture of where you are. What is rewarded and what isn't? What are the costs of entry in this environment? What will it take to convince others that interdisciplinarity is valuable? Others of you will be frustrated in your attempts to keep this side of your academic life going, particularly if you land a job that is primarily focused on teaching. Some graduates from my own department are in that boat, and they tell me that what has sustained their need for interdisciplinarity since earning the PhD has been to put together courses that embody it through the readings, guest lecturers, etc. One of my former students tells me that his interdisciplinarity, cor interdisciplinary course on environmental sustainability is turning out to be one of the most popular classes at the college where he teaches. He did it because he was bored with the discipline-based courses he was contractually obligated to teach. But this raises a couple of other questions that really have less to do with all of you and your graduate training and more to do with the academic world in which we all currently exist. We laud interdisciplinarity, but could it be? Is interdisciplinarity actually an excuse toward making a leaner, meaner university? Are interdisciplinary efforts a way to test for relevance? Are they a prelude to cutting courses and departments? Do we need to keep an eye on interdisciplinarity? Or is this just one of the many necessary mechanisms through which the university must creatively destroy itself to maintain its societal relevance? And finally, one of the big changes afoot in primary and secondary education in this country is the adoption of the Common Core Standards in 46 U.S. states. That new curriculum, which is being rolled out right now, places a high premium on both embodied and collaborative interdisciplinarity. Students are expected to use active learning strategies to connect seemingly disparate subject matter. Math gets taught in reading class, literary interpretation gets taught in social studies, etc. For those of you who will go into the professoriate in the U.S., those common core students will be in your classrooms in a few years' time. Will you be ready for them, given the interdisciplinary experience they've just a thought. Thank you. <laughs> so, any questions, comments? I'd love to get a dialogue going about some of these issues. I've, I've really had fun um, reflecting on what interdisciplinarity has been to me and uh, some of the costs and benefits that it's presented with in my own life. So, anybody else want to chime in here? Yeah, Trish. Hi, Ann. Um, that was fantastic. <laughs> Thank I really you. enjoyed it. I wonder if you have thoughts on our funding environment right now. So, you, you sort of alluded to it in terms of the transformation and change that's ongoing in the academy, but things are quite turbulent. Um, on the funding level. So would you comment on that? Boy, where to begin? Exactly. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll try this moving target. One of the things that really concerns me is every time there is a, a CFP that's issued that happens to be interdisciplinary in, nation, in nature, like let's say for Ivers, there's this mad rush on campus to assemble the right people. And there's all of this energy that is put into trying to go after this pot of gold. And a lot of, um, I think, good social capital is developed in the process. But 
these are highly competitive grants. And the likelihood of getting anything out of them is very small. And the problem I found is that oftentimes when something is rejected, and it may have actually been rated very highly, is that discouragement sets in and the project gets dropped. And that's confusing, I think, for the faculty and also the graduate students who have been roped into all of this because they've really invested a lot of time and emotion and intellectual energy on trying to you know, push something forward. And I'm starting to think that the university needs to do more to help salvage those kinds of projects instead of just letting it die or saying, okay, that didn't work, we're gonna move on to the next uh, just-in-time assembly of researchers to go after the next CFP. So that's, that's one comment I have about that. I'm also really concerned about what's happening with the, the shrinkage of government funding for grant research and, the, and how targeted <coughs> that has now become towards certain topics. And it's interesting also to watch colleagues read, and I must admit that I probably fall into this category, reinvent ourselves on the fly to try to participate within that. And while it's intellectually rewarding, I, I don't know if this is a really good thing because I think it sort of makes us into dilettantes. <coughs> so, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate the comments. Uh, I've been on the National Science Foundation review team for our center, say the major university, I won't say which. Um, and they, pulled, they tried to pull together an interdisciplinary transdisciplinary team that focused on some really solid environmental issues. The review team was really tough. I was amazed at saying, well, the, the questions aren't theoretically grounded enough, right? Which, as you move toward more transdisciplinary, may get a little shallow in terms of, you know, the research questions. So you're in a real dilemma in, in, that, in that kind of situation. Um, I will say a, a sort of comment, I've been working eight years with a group called the We've been trying to move towards the, you know, single discipline to plural, plural disciplinary structure of academic programs, especially dealing with sustainability. Um, and as you move toward the transdisciplinary to plural disciplinary, it becomes much more expensive in terms of maintaining the kind of training and folks that we need to do that. That's right. I think um, part of the problem is that the startup costs terms of time, just learning each other's language, it takes a long time. For instance, um, I did some collaborative work with an architect, and she kept using the word typology. And I thought she was talking about a classification system. And one day, it suddenly dawned on us that when I said the word morphology, that was what she meant when she said typology. And it took us two years of collaborating to figure that out. A year, the whole time, we thought we knew what the other person was talking about. And in some ways, that's a very rewarding aspect of doing transdisciplinary kinds of research. But it takes so long to get to that point. And like I said in the talk, I think that sometimes we're, we're just on the verge of making those kinds of breakthroughs, and then we for whatever reason, are called back into our departments or lose funding. And it's really, it's very difficult. Um, I don't want to paint a, a dreary picture, though, about doing interdisciplinary research because it's a wonderful thing, but I think you're absolutely spot on with your comments. So thank you. So I have sort of uh, two understandings of this, this issue, and they're sort of, in my view, what happens kind of inside of the university that's you know, within the control, like the review boards that Dr. Spartan mentioned. Um, then there's sort of what happens outside the university as far as perceptions and, and public receptiveness towards funding these sorts of activities. So um, within the university, I was curious about the little diagram that you drew that's circular going into tenure and then into interdisciplinarity and then into tenure and so forth. Um, I don't know if you expected that to be sort of looked closely at, but could you talk just a little bit more about that cycle and sure. sort of how it, how it impacts the university side? Which one do you side? want? Do you want this one? Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I think one way 
it really impacts the university is at tenure time. Because there is this labor, this interdisciplinary labor that the university, that administrators and deans would really love for us to do. But yet, part of the decision-making process about who gets tenure is within your department and is also done by a committee at this university at the college level who are also coming out of departments. <coughs> and so there's this real tug of war here between the institution's goals for interdisciplinarity and the local goals of, just like the second speaker said in that clip, the local goal of being a star in your own discipline. And, and that tension is, I think, is real. And we certainly saw it with scholarship in action. Because scholarship in action was calling us into the community, it was calling us to partner with others on campus to do things that were difficult to judge under the old <coughs> discipline-based model. And I still think that is something that tenure committees are trying to work out. That's one place where I see this thing really coming to life. And, and there truly is a tension there, and it can be argued both ways. And I often find myself speaking out of both sides of my mouth on this issue. Because I love my discipline, but at the same time, I, I love the fact that I'm in the Moynihan Institute. Yes? I'm sorry, so the other part of my comment there um, is, so the outside uh, sort of view of things, to what extent do universities have the opportunity or even the responsibility to sort of, um, there's a sort of public dialogue happening about sort of justifying research funding in science. Um, you know, it's, it's not really something that I struggle with, but to what extent, you know, is that a problem because there's also, you know, it's difficult to justify certain types of research where you don't know the application might be 20, 30 years down the road too, so. I'm not really sure that I've got an answer for that question. I, I guess I can tell a story, and Trish knows the story. Um, several years ago, I was involved in an Iger application that involved Maxwell and the iSchool. And this was in 2002, 2003, right when Wi-Fi was being sort of rolled out. And what we thought would be a really interesting thing to do as part of the Erie Canal National Heritage Corridor was to set up, set up a series of hotspots in places that potential local providers were probably not going to be going to for some time. And so we came up with this program for how to sort of couple community development, community engagement with Wi-Fi, we talked about the digital divide, which back in those days was theorized in a very sort of simple kind of way because it was a new concept. But you know, we, we thought this would be a really good opportunity to explore that concept and also do something within the community and really see where the technology, which was changing so quickly, um, would take us. And I remember one day at one of our meetings, Craig Waters, who was part of, part of this team, um, came in really excited. He said, you'll never believe where I just was. He said, where were you? He said, I was at that, that parking lot on South Salina in front of the Family Dollar Store with, um, with this guy who had a hot spot in his trunk. And we said, what are you talking about? And he said, he had this thing in the back of his trunk where I could plug my computer into it. This is even before the days of Bluetooth. I could plug my computer into it, and I was on the internet sitting in front of the family dollar store. And we're going, that's really amazing. And so we built this into our proposal. So we sent it off to NSF. It says, you know, the, the, the reviews come back that say, this was really great in terms of, you know, theorization, da 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 da, but it's totally impractical. These technologies will never take off. Um, <laughs> So therefore, we rate this a good, which is the, the same as saying it's crap. Um, this is a good proposal. We're rejecting it. And I would love to find whoever s said that and show him my cell phone, my all my Bluetooth devices, and say, 
you know, we would have been coming to the end of those five years about two years ago, okay? And I think of all of the really wonderful things that have happened technologically and with civic engagement and the re-theorization of the digital divide and where that project could have been. It, it breaks my heart. Yeah. Uh, I really appreciate it. Your presentation it makes it all very clear for the rest of the day. Um, I'm wondering about, like, do we need a, a new discipline of, inter of interdisciplinary scholars? <laughs> um, that, you know, that have the role of, it, there, is, there are no really interesting questions that don't require interdisciplinary input to, to solve them. Um, and, and it seems like, you know, that there is a set of skills yeah. to sort of pull a question apart and say, okay, this discipline needs to address this, and these, and these are the kinds of ways that you need to talk to each other. And you don't see much of that happening. Uh, you know, it would be nice to sort of have a, you know, a, a department of interdisciplinary scholarship. Yeah. You know, just so, so that becomes a discipline yeah. in, itself, in and of itself. And you know what administrators would say to that? That's more overhead. I think it's a great idea. I mean, we're sort of struggling with this right now in the SU University Senate. I'm on the Committee on Instruction. And we've been looking at the new pedagogies ad hoc committee report that was released last summer. And one of the um, one of the suggestions is to create a center for pedagogy on campus that student that grad students and faculty could both go to to sort of share ideas about how to do pedagogy and how to you know share teaching strategies and things like that. And you know, it's one of our primary missions within the within this academy or an academic setting, and yet what we've heard from higher up is that you know the overhead would just be too much to have anything like that. We could have a virtual center, but nothing, you know, sort of bricks and mortar that that's not on the table. And I think that what you're suggesting is really similar in terms of research. That it really would be great to have a place on campus that we could go to to share these kinds of ideas. But, but there are a little bit of that, and that's why I know that these one around have been doing it for eight years. We talk about those kinds of things. How do, how, do you, how do you make it work? How do you structure a curriculum? How do you get people to do research and collaborate with transdisciplinary both? Right? We're, we're trying to deal with that it right sounds now. Sounds like a great group. You know, we've got three book chapters we're working on to sort of track that up. But I agree, on any given university, you don't have that. Right. Yeah, and I think if you end up in a place that has something like that, you truly are blessed. Sure. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah, so I actually found your comments um, actually sort of on this specific issue about focus on this kind of sustainability Uh, now, 
but what makes, uh, I think, uh, the people in my program to introduce many scholars is that uh, we're driven rather than by this <coughs> consideration, we're driven by the questions and what we need to answer those questions. Um, and a lot of the times, the most interesting questions, you know, I mean, they're questions, they don't, they don't adhere to the requirements of, you know, can you track career or right. the discipline and so on, they need requires uh, different approaches and different perspectives. Uh, and so that's where you learn to uh, really um, borrow from other disciplines that you're not actually grounded in and to bring that perspective, I think, is what really makes it uh, valuable. Yeah. I, what you're talking about is exactly what I meant when I showed you the hollow bunny versus the solid chocolate bunny. That's ex exactly what my friend Lori Wilkie at Berkeley talks about. Um, and I think that with your program, I think one of the really fabulous things that I've discovered over the years is that the kinds of students that are attracted <coughs> to your program are really motivated. And the ones who are successful really, they, they have this wonderful ability to not cobble things together, but to, it's almost like a jigsaw puzzle, to make things fit together, and they're very creative. And I think you're absolutely right. They're not boxed in in the same way that they might be if they were coming through one of the discipline-based departments. But that's not for everybody. I think it takes a very special person to to do social science or to do a program, interdisciplinary program like that. The one thing that's always concerned me though is the marketability of people who come out of programs like that. On the one hand, they can apply for everything, but it takes a very special department on the receiving end when they see that dossier to take it seriously. And that's one thing that's always concerning about interdisciplinary programs like that. So, thank you for your comment. It was good. Well, I think thank you. Yeah. Our, well, thank hour. you so much. I really enjoyed doing this, and the, the Q and A has been really enlightening and has made me remember some things that I've forgotten. And thank you for telling me about the Daytona group. That's really. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Aaron.